Um, can I welcome members to the 34th meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, I've received an apology from uh, Monica Lennon, uh, but we welcome again Pauline McNeill as a substitute. Um, agenda item one is decision on taking business in private, and it's proposed that the committee takes item six in private. Uh, that item is consideration of the evidence heard from the Minister from Parliamentary Business, uh, which we'll hear soon, on the work of the committee during the parliamentary year 2016-17. Uh, does the committee agree to take this item in private? Okay. Uh, and so we'll move on to agenda item two, uh, which is consideration of the work of the committee during 2016-17. And can I welcome to the meeting uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Parliamentary Business. Welcome, Minister. Um, Alan Ellis, Head of Legislation Team, Parliament and Legislation Team. Uh, Fiona Burnett, um, Solicitor and Deputy Head of Business Division, Scottish Government Legal Directorate. And our old friend Luke McBratney, uh, Head of Legislative Consequences of EU Withdrawal Team, Scottish Government. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, Minister, do you want to make any opening remarks? Uh, very, very briefly. Obviously, this is my first appearance before the committee since you took over as convener, um, and I look forward to working with you and the committee over the coming months. Uh, I want to start by thanking the convener and the committee for your letter of the 30th of November about our progress on amending instruments. It's always good to receive positive feedback. I think it's also, I'd also like to take the opportunity to put on record my thanks to the former convener. There is no question that his tenacity had a role in the progress that we've made in reducing our extending commitments, and it's a priority for me that we'll reduce this further, and myself and officials are working with colleagues to do so. Clearly, in terms of challenges ahead, Brexit looms large. While the legislative implications remain unclear, I'm certain it's going to require even better planning, quality assurance and explanation of the government's SSI programme. And that's a challenge which Mr Russell and I are jointly tackling. The committee's recent report on the EU withdrawal bill raises some interesting points, which I am currently reflecting on with Mr Russell. Um, but happy to obviously take any, any questions going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll pass on your thanks to John Scott when I, when I see him. Um, and with regard to the letter we sent you, we just we felt very strongly as a committee that it's easy to criticise, uh, but we should also praise as well um, yeah, when, when, when that's worth doing. So we'll move on to um, questions. I'm going to take the uh, first section, which will be around quality of instruments. Um, we've split the questions into sections, uh, so I'll, I'll deal with the first few and then we'll, we'll move round. Um, so the first question is, um, the committee noted the quality of instruments for the most part have continued to improve over the course of the last parliamentary year. Um, we welcome the government's progress in this area, but what's the government doing to maintain the quality of instruments being presented to parliament? I think in, in general terms we are pleased that I think the, the quality is at historic high and, and the, the number of times that you're having to report is historically low, but we do recognise that on occasions there have been one or two areas where the, the, the quality hasn't met what our ex high expectations, um, particularly around tribunals. Um, so we have put in place a number of measures to try and, and keep on top of that and to continue to improve the quality. Perhaps uh, Fiona, do you want to just talk about some of the things that we've done to try and maintain the progress that we've made in improving quality. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Convener. Um, SGLD takes um, the quality control very seriously. Um, it's invidious to use terms like uh, perfection, but honestly, that is what we st strive to provide uh, when we're bringing forward subordinate legislation. Um, so we have a whole suite of uh, tools that we use to try and ensure that that's the case. Um, and checks happen at every level of the hierarchy as they go through um, divisions and through the unit and then to the parliament. Um, um, one of the most important measures that we've put in place in the last reporting year is the increase um, in size of the pool of stylists. So these are the solicitors who perform a double check, a second pair of eyes check on the instruments. Um, I think in previous years there haven't perhaps been enough uh, we 
perceived a slight gap in the numbers and so we've in increased that. We've also increased the length of time that the stylists have to perform the checks and we feel that that's, um, that's brought uh, a benefit. Um, the other important aspect to what we do is um, good communications. So we have, we're fortunate to enjoy good relationships with Parliament and legislation units and also with the clerks and with your own legal advisors. Um, we look as a, as a group of stylists at the uh, quarterly reports and take points from that as training, um, as, as training points with, with the group of stylists. And that information is then dissemina disseminated to the drafters. So we feel that the processes are robust um, with the high levels of work that people are um, dealing with. Very occasionally, small elements of human error will unfortunately uh, creep in, but we do feel that these are, are really uh, occasional. Um, and whilst we strive to um, reduce these to an absolute minimum, unfortunately, they will, they will creep in to some extent. Um, I don't know if you wanted me to speak specifically about tribunals. <coughs> Or we'll if that come, gives you we'll, enough we'll, just now. We'll, we'll come on to that. Um, I, I just um, wonder if, if you can explain um, the sort of num the, the checking process that, that you go through. No, no problem. Um, so the drafter uh, works alongside the policy colleague to provide a draft. Um, that draft is then checked by a senior lawyer and then a further senior lawyer, so um, a C2 lawyer and then a divisional solicitor. Uh, these checks are not optional, the checks are compulsory um, and that's part of um, the Minister's commitment to you is that all of those checks will, will happen and they do. Um, after the divisional solicitor check, um, the stylist check take, takes place. So we have a team of um, solicitors who, who, are, who do this role above their uh, drafting role um, and they are, what we do is we, t we take an instrument from one area and it's always checked by a solicitor from a different area. So they truly have a fresh pair of eyes and m nine times out of ten they will, they will pick up any, any little defects. Um, the instruments are, always, are also um, checked um, in a sort of mechanical way um, through formatting validation uh, with the typing pool. So um, there are sort of two, two, two strands to that. So, so we've got drafter, senior lawyer, stylist. Well, there's a senior uh, lawyer, a sort of a divisional solicitor after the senior lawyer. Okay, who, who four, four stages. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the processes involve a lot of pairs of eyes looking at the instruments, and they, they should, in the majority of cases, pick up most, most errors. Okay. Okay. The process that we put in place is part of the reason that we are at this historic low in terms of yeah. where you're having to report, but there's clearly 12% is not 0%, so there's still progress that we no. can make. So. Right. And we're not complacent at all. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so 10 instruments were either withdrawn or revoked over the last parliamentary year. Uh, this suggests that instruments uh, were laid that were not up to the required standard. So what measures are in place to ensure that this doesn't happen? So obviously the, the number of instruments that has have been withdrawn is, is um, down compared to previous years. And obviously um, I think the majority of the instruments that you're referring to were from one, one package in relation to tribunals. Um, and you know we recognise that, that the quality there was not up to the standard that we'd be expecting. Um, what, what is very important is that the instruments that are passed by the Parliament do what we expect them to do, and they are understandable. And at the end of the day, we really appreciate the work that this committee does in helping that process, but we understand it's our responsibility to bring the instruments um, in to this committee at a quality that they should be. Um, as I say, the number that have had to be withdrawn have reduced from previous years, but again, we're still aiming to improve that more and at least half of the, the number you're talking about were in relation to one package. Yeah, okay. Uh, and we'll come on to that now. Um, so we, we were quite exercised over um, the package of instruments under the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014. Uh, and this followed on from serious concerns about a package of instruments under that same act last year. Um, so what consideration has the government given to the way in which it lays packages of instruments in particular to the way 
uh, in which it programs the laying of such instruments and the quality control processes <laughs> that are applied to them. Yeah, certainly it's, it's our intention that government will do everything we can to lay packages of instruments at the same time and where that's not being done to provide an explanation for, for why that's the case. And you know, we are taking an active interest in, in, in packages in particular. We know that it's something that um, exercises the, the committee and, and rightly so. Um, so I think Fiona's um, laid out some of the, the, the things that we're doing to try and imp improve that. But we, we understand the committee's concerns around this and it's, it's, it's a high priority for us. Right. Um, so, despite the um, checks and balances that you that you've got, mistakes still come through, uh, and they filter through to us. Um, so, 62 instruments uh, over the reporting period contained minor mistakes, um, and recently it looks as though that's been increasing. So, in the current uh, reporting period, 38% of instruments laid by the government contained minor mistakes um, so what what was it despite what you've said um, I mean the, the and these really are small things drafting errors that shouldn't really be getting through um, so what you know despite despite what you've said what uh, what checks are you are you planning are you planning to put any extra checks in because the these things shouldn't really get into us as the, and the big thing that Fiona talked about was us looking to have extra resource um, because obviously people are, are doing substantial amounts of work. Um, so I think we've, we've got the correct steps in place. We've in, improved our procedures, but I think there is, we are, we're looking to improve the, the resource that we have to do that work. And, and hopefully that will, will trickle through and you'll see a continued improvement. Obviously, we have seen an improvement over, over the years um, to the quality and um, coming out of government, um, but we want to continue that improvement and that's what we're determined to do. Well, I, I, mean, I accept what you say, but last, last week, for example, we, we considered the Alcohol uh, Minimum Pricing Act um, and that, uh, the commencement order, not, not, not the actual act, but that, that was only two pages long, but it had four minor points in it, um, which isn't really good enough. Yeah, and, 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 um, and so it's obviously our aim is to strive to, for perfection um, and we've put in steps, additional additional steps to continue to improve that. But it is useful for the committee to always flag that up to us so we can see if there is a pattern, if, yeah. if there is an area where we've got a particular problem, then uh, Fiona and the team will, will look at um, how we can address that so that f for as often as possible you're getting instruments which do what they say they should do and don't have either major or minor errors. None of us want to be in this position. Okay. Yeah, Stuart. Just a quick supplementary for me. Yeah. Just thank you. Just uh, uh, good morning, Minister. Just in terms of the the procedures uh, that uh, that Fiona spoke about, the, the four layers that you have, has that been a new uh, a new situation that uh, that you have, or has that been something that's been there maybe for a number of months? And also, when did that process actually yes. come in? So so we've continued to try to improve the process and make it more robust, but. Fiona, do you want to talk about just the changes that we yes. made? <clears throat> Thank you. That system has been in place for a number of years, um, but I think it's just a case of tightening up, um, uh, just making sure that they, they now happen compulsorily, uh, you know, every time, um, and uh, increasing the length of time that stylists have to perform the checks has been a quite an important improvement as well. Um, so it's just, it's honed a system that was pre-existing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll move on to the next section of questions. Uh, Alison Harris. Yes. Good morning, Minister. The committee noted that there had been a reduction in the number of instruments laid this year. So would you like to comment on the way in which the secondary legislation programme is managed? And further, what are the reasons for the drop in number of instruments laid? So the, the number of instruments um, will fluctuate depending on, on, on the legislation and, and requirements. So there's no um, aim to hold back um, instruments. Uh, we do try to manage as much as possible so as that um, instruments are over the year. I know it's a particular concern to, to this committee if there are um, peaks um, of, of instruments, troughs as well, because um, the concern. But so we, tr we try to manage the, the programme um, over the course of the year. Um, that's not always possible, and there will always still sometimes be, be peaks, but there's nothing um, untoward. It's, um, the, the number of instruments required will vary from year to year depending on the legislation. Now. Okay. 
whilst I don't want to go on to the next set of questions, I just, I, if I'm correct, you said that the scrutiny comes in with the length of time. You're giving people more time to scrutinise to ensure that we get the correct legislation. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, that's one of the tools, I suppose, that we're using. It's just an increased time. I just wonder how that's going to affect going forward when, you know, with the EU, is how, you know, if you give them more time and there's more bills, how, how are you going to factor that in? Well, it's something that we are looking at. Um, it's difficult. I think we're all operating slightly in an information vacuum um, just now. Um, we would all like a little bit more um, information as to how we, this is all going to progress. Um, we have got plans in place uh, for, a vari for varying scenarios, and we're ready to implement them once we know what the final picture looks like so what one, one of the things though in terms of time is is, is increased resource so that, i mean that, that's a way of managing time that if there's a set okay. amount of work if there's more people to do that work then that's okay. one way of managing that so okay. that's one of the things we're looking at <coughs> thank you so i think Stuart, you've got some questions around this uh, yes uh, certainly kind of partly uh, partly dealt with and uh, no, that's okay, Alison. <laughs> uh, so, certainly, as uh, as Minister, will be aware. Of, I also sit on the on the European uh, Committee here in the Parliament, and and you touched upon the, the issue of uh, with the EU withdrawal bill in your opening comments, and uh, as well as the the, the additional resource uh, implications that uh, that you are uh, looking at, uh, what other action uh, will the uh, will the Scottish Government be undertaking uh, when it comes to the, the laying of instruments because of the increased number of, uh, potentially, increased number of uh, bills and, uh, and statutory instruments that come forward? The, the big challenge for us is that we still don't know exactly what that's going to look like. Um, and that, that's a challenge. Um, I, I don't know if, it, if even the, the government in Westminster knows what that's going to look like. Um, so that, that's our biggest challenge. We certainly, um, our, our proposal would be to work with the parliament to, to, to look at how how we can deal with an increased number of, of instruments. Um, we certainly don't approve of the the, the kind of um, the, the, the way that the Westminster government plans to take things forward. We think that this needs to be a partnership with, with the parliament and um, I think we're keen to work with the parliament to, to, to find ways to allow us to um, do the kind of scrutiny that is required um, in an appropriate way. One, one aspect that, uh, that has been uh, considered in the past uh, has been the issue of the, well, that, that working relationship uh, between us yourselves and uh, the Scottish Parliament and the, the, the issue of uh, sharing of information. Um, do you have any, uh, any indication as to, uh, as to kind of what length of time that you would actually want to uh, introduce for that so that, uh, that the Parliament can have that information at, a, at an earlier stage? Uh, if possible, so that they can work on it? Obviously, the challenge for us is that we can't share information that we, we, we don't have, but obviously there's a, a bit of thinking going on to, to look across um, across government as to, to what is likely. But Luke, do you want to maybe make some comments? <coughs> yeah. Unfortunately, Luke's got a sore throat, so... There's an ongoing project to identify the range and scale of... Uh... So that was so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a... <laughs> Start There's again. a project <laughs> ongoing to identify the range and scale of deficiencies that might be caused in devolved Scottish legislation. That project obviously has to be neutral to a number of different things, including the scenario on which the UK might exit the EU, which is currently uncertain, and the uh, state that the EU withdrawal will be in when it's passed. Obviously, as uh, members will be aware, that bill is currently being considered by the House of Commons and the Scottish and Welsh governments have proposed amendments to it. Um, we hope to have the first results of that project in early in the new year, and we've committed to sharing that at an official level first with the parliamentary authorities. Uh, one other aspect that, uh, that has been discussed uh, in the past has been the issue of the, also this committee's uh, potential uh, increased role in considering the instruments from the EU withdrawal bill. And do you think that uh, there is merit in actually increasing the, the, the number of members on this committee to actually deal with that going forward? I think that's certainly something we, we need to consider at the time when we see that, and it's obviously something I would have to discuss with um, other business managers. Um, when the, the committees were set up, one of the things that we agreed uh, uh, you know, across unanimously across the business across the parties was that each committee should um, have a makeup which is roughly equivalent to the chamber so the government should always be one member short of a majority so 
clearly if we did want to expand the, this committee, it would have implications across the parliament in terms of the resource that we have. So it's certainly something I think we should consider, um, but we, we need to see exactly what it's going to look like and how um, we jointly think that we can take this forward to, um, to deal with whatever the workload is. Uh, and final question, uh, can we just, it's in terms of the, uh, you spoke about the looking for additional resources uh, earlier, Minister, and the, uh, as well as the EU withdrawal bill, there'll still be the, the, the everyday uh, processes that will take place. And so with uh, this, uh, these additional resources, will that, uh, are you, uh, the answer is probably going to be yes, but certainly, will you be looking to make sure that you will be able to deal with both uh, the, the existing uh, responsibilities that are required, as well as what may come down the line regarding the EU withdrawal bill? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the people of Scotland um, voted um, in 2016 for this election. They did not vote for Brexit, so it's important that we do manage to deliver on their, their aspirations in terms of domestic policy as well. OK. Thank you. OK. Um, David. Thank you. Convener, and good morning, Minister. The committee is pleased to note that relatively few commitments are outstanding for a period covered by a committee's report. However, there are, remain a number of historic commitments outstanding from previous parliamentary years. What action is the government proposing to take to meet each of the historic commitments? And are these commitments to correct legislation still necessary? So, we've, the previous was an issue that the previous convener um, had a, as a, an absolute priority and um, I guess um, he helped us get to the point where now there are um, 14, I think, um, commitments which remain um, uh, to, to be com complete, completed. And it is a priority for us to, to continue to reduce that. Um, we have asked um, officials across government to look at the remaining commitments. Um, and I, I think to see where we think we can um, meet those commitments but also just to, to check whether there, perhaps there are some of them which actually we can say don't require any further action and we should just accept that, that what's in place is working and um, either there aren't opportunities or they aren't the, the commitment is no longer required. Um, so we'd be hoping to come back to the committee early in the new year, I think, to, to, to further expand on that just as to how, how we manage to take that forward because I think it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable point that we've made a commitment um, and they've been they're quite historic, then we should be able to say what we think we're, we're going to do going forward. I, th I think we we just need to clear it up, don't yep. we? Um, clear the decks. Yep. Good. Alison, you've got another one? Yes, I would like to ask that can you update the committee on the action it proposes to take to consolidate the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Regulations 2012 and the Council Tax Reduction State Pension Credit Scotland Regulations 2012? So... Um, the Cabinet Secretary has given a commitment that we um, accept that this is something that should be consolidated, but it is a significant amount of work to do. This is not, it's not a, a minor piece of work, um, so um, I don't think at this stage I can commit as to, to when that would happen, but we do recognise it's something that, that we would we'd want to do, um, but, but it, it would be a major piece of work that we'd be asking people to, to, to do, and, and obviously there are other priorities as well. So I... Um, I think the, the Cabinet Secretary is committed to come back to expand further on timescales, and um, I, th I think I'll let him do that. I think he's looking currently at just exactly how much work it would, would entail, but it's a reasonable consolidation is generally a good thing, particularly with something which is being used on a day-to-day -day basis like, like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, have you any idea when the Cabinet Secretary might come back to us? Um, I don't, but we can chase up on that. Okay, thank you. Um, Pauline? Yeah, good morning, Minister. Um, I wanted to ask you about framework bills. Um, so obviously where there's a framework bill, the policy is developed later and so you won't see the detail of the regulation until much later. Um, I, I often think that the, the role of this committee is a wee bit underestimated. I think when people think when you pass legislation at stage three and it gets oil assent, then that's the law. What they don't appreciate is actually the detail of that still to come. And in many ways, parliamentarians well, don't really have control over that. The government has control over that. So I'm, really, I, I'm interested in much closer scrutiny and understanding of that process. Now, you'll be aware that we've just, just been in the process of looking at a framework bill, which is the Social Security um, bill. 
and the Minister has said that that's necessary because of the nature of what we're doing here. Um, so my first question is, is there any intention to use framework bills more often or are they going to be for specific purposes? Yeah, no, I think your, 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 your example is, is very good. I think um, there's no trend towards framework bills, but there are, as you say, circumstances where um, it is more appropriate um, in order to have the ongoing flexibility. Um, and the Social Security Bill is, is a good point where we're, we have a framework bill for, for a good reason. Um, and I hope that the approach that we took in there with um, the, the Minister coming to this committee and um, sharing that information prior um, to, to introduction um, is, 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 was helpful. Um, and that's something I'll try and encourage if there is reasons for us having framework bills um, going forward that we have that early engagement with this committee because we do understand that, the, that it's important to yourselves because it does mean more work um, down, down the line in terms of scrutiny of the, of the um, further instruments. Mm -hmm. so in, in cases where... Um, so we passed legislation and the government can draw down that power. I'm just thinking of one that's coming up this week. So the rent pressure zone, for example, so we legislated... And then the government's got to decide at what point it actually brings forward the detail of that. Do, do you think there should be? Do you think the parliament should have any more say in when that is? Because I mean, I suppose the government could just not draw that down the whole session of the parliament, couldn't they? I think there is always scrutiny. Any powers that we have to do something, there is always scrutiny um, of um, how we take that forward. Um, there's always the opportunity for, for people to put pressure on government if they think we're not taking a power soon enough. But, but generally, um, the, the process is very much about consultation. And so, um, you know, the consultation on the detail of the use of a particular power is something that we would do going forward. Um, so I, th I think that's the appropriate way, and I think that's the same with just really just about any any legislation. Uh -huh. I suppose that's kind of my yeah. point that we can't consult on it until you decide you're going to take the power. Um, sorry, sorry. Yeah. When I was talking, about, it's the the government that would would consult in terms of how they use a power mm. going forward. So um, there's that kind of engagement, and um, so there is an opportunity for for the parliament to engage at that at that time. Um, and just finally, um, so how would um, you as a minister consider that more information could be provided to the committee to allow it to perform its um, scrutiny functions on framework bills? Yeah, I, I, I think um, Jean Freeman has, has shown a model of, of I think, um, good practice that I am trying to encourage other ministers to follow. Um, I think the way that she engaged at an early stage with this committee, understanding that while... Um, she might see the Social Security Committee as the main committee that, for, for that bill. She understood that, this, that there are other committees, and this one in particular, that have particular interests. And, and I think that good practice is something I'm trying to encourage other colleagues um, to, to follow. Just, can you know, just, just finally, just while I happen to be here, or, and you've mentioned, mentioned the bill, because um, you think you're going to sit in the Social Security um, committee. Um, I think it's just worth considering um, in terms of the parliamentary process that where well, you have a framework bill and you're t you, you, so you don't know what the policy is going to be too much further down the line and you're trying to decide have the government got the balance right. I think it's quite important that the parliamentary timetable does not stress the committee too far in the sense that I think you know my view is it would probably just make it but the timetable is very tight. If you want, if you want, if you really believe in proper scrutiny, I, I, I just say that as just an, an observation that, as Minister for Parliament, it's worth considering in a framework bill that you want to make sure the committee, because the timetable is the same as it would be for any other bill, and you might want to consider in those cases just have a wee bit of slack in the system to make sure that the. Yeah, I, th I think that's a reasonable point, and we always um, spend a bit of time discussing with the clerk of committee and the, and the convener about the kind of timetables that we expect and ultimately Bureau, um, Bureau agrees the timetable. It's a balance between giving the time and, and wanting the legislation to, to be able to, to be used to hopefully improve the lives of people in Scotland. That's you know, it's what we're aiming to do, and, but there, there's that balance. But I think your point is well made. Thank you very much, Kimia. No, that's a, that's, that's a reasonable point. And there's actually today another framework bill, which is the planning bill. 
Um, Stuart, I think you had the final question. Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, in the past, uh, the committee and myself have raised the issue of the, the Scottish Law Commission bills, uh, which uh, we certainly have welcomed. And, uh, but the point of, um, of potentially bringing more than one bill uh, or one area together so that, uh, that the bills may actually be larger and to, to actually get more uh, through the process as compared to the length of time it does take to get a Scottish Law Commission bill uh, through the Parliament. Uh, is that something that, uh, that you have given uh, some consideration to? One of the, the, the challenges that, that we have is in order to use the process of, be, of um, bringing um, <coughs> a, a Law Commission bill through this committee, um, there are a number of criteria that would have to be met and um, obviously the bigger the bill is, the more difficult it would be um, for us to meet the criteria. So I think if we feel that we want to deal with more topics, then it might be <coughs> worth looking at the criteria because I think that, that's, that's the, actually the stumbling block in terms of um, being able to bring um, more uh, Law Commission bills through this committee is, is that the criteria that is currently in place and it might be something that the committee wants to, to consider as to whether actually we want to look at relaxing that a little bit so that there can be some degree of controversy because right now it has to be really effectively entirely uncontroversial for it to come to this committee and you know while that's on the basis that this committee has particular technical um, experience I think that there's now been enough experience of, of uh, law commission bills coming through here that you probably might feel in the the ability to do something a little bit more um, controversial or complex, um, but I think we would need to look at the the criteria. I think that's the that would be the key. Yeah. Oh, that's helpful. It's, um, I think certainly I think we've all um, probably you know, appreciated uh, that experience uh, and and certainly the processes uh, that we have went through. Um, but uh, and your point regarding the the fact that the, the bills have been uh, non-contentious has uh, certainly been something that uh, I think has certainly aided the process but uh, I think it's, it's something we could probably have a discussion about later thank you okay okay any members have any follow-up questions no okay um, that exhausts our line of questioning um, I'll just say on a personal level I've welcomed the uh, dialogue that I've had with you uh, minister and hope that continues uh, okay. so thank you for for your time this morning and uh, I hope your voice gets better, Mr. McBratney. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'll suspend the meeting briefly. Thank you. Right, we're moving on to um, agenda item three. If uh, committee members can stop uh, chatting amongst themselves, we're on to agenda item three, uh, which is consideration of an instrument subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the draft police investigations and review commissioner application and modification of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016. Scotland Order 2017. Is the committee content with this instrument? Okay. Uh, agenda item four is consideration of an instrument subject to negative procedure. No points have been raised by our advisors on SSI 2017-415. Is the committee content with this instrument? Okay. Uh, agenda item five is consideration of an instrument not subject to any parliamentary procedure and no points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI 2017-414. Is the committee content with this instrument? Okay. I'll move the meeting into private.